uh, lived around me every day um, first opened my eyes to to things outside of myself. But the photography gave me kind of a wanderlust. Um, it, it gave me the means, you know, I, or I hope that it would, to travel throughout the world and learn more about people, um, our similarities, our differences. And I thought magazines would be a great way to get the word out because, well, um, they can do so at the time that these things are happening and they can reach a massive population um, at the time that these things are happening. Um, it's a great opportunity. Well, here's my first um, time out. This, this was an image, uh, well, backtrack just a second. Seven and a half months I was in Africa the first time before the money ran out. And I was shooting digital and I was very insecure. And I wanted to be a magazine photographer, so I made magazine-like pictures because I hoped that editors would publish them. Um, I shot 90,000 photographs in that first seven and a half months, so that's like 450 some a day. Um, and I, I worked my butt off. But um, I came back and I went to New York and I met with all the magazines and all the newspapers I could. And um, I published one photograph that year. And it just so happened that when I was sitting in Newsweek's office, some random editor came up and said, hey, we're doing a a story on third world health, and uh, you just might have images that that pertain to this. And I'm like, yeah, I know I do. I'll send you a disc, and we can work something out. So um, I send them the disc, and then they show me this layout because I'm an independent contractor. Uh, the copyright is mine, and I asked to approve the layout. So they send me this PDF document, which is. Um, you know, just to, to a mock layout um, on a story on third world health where we're living in Louisville. My photograph is used across two pages to start the article out. The article finishes with two more pages um, filled with content, other photographers' pictures used well, um, uh, maps showing the mortality rates throughout the world. So where the map gets colorful and dark is where mortality is more of an issue. Um, graphs, statistics, great, well, so we're, this, is, this came out in September 2003, and this is like a year after I sold my car, and you know, like the, the bastard black sheep in the family uh, comes back with nothing to show for it. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is a way for me to sort of um, buy myself a little bit of time to, to keep pursuing my dreams. So I go out and I buy this magazine at our little bookstore. I live in a small little town in, in Lake Michigan. Um, Lake Michigan. And uh, so I go to our, our little bookstore, I pick it up, don't even look at it because I know it's the right issue. I mean, uh, everything was laid out. So I drive over to my dad's warehouse and drop it on his desk and he kind of has this grin on his face and he's like, what'd you do, you know? And so he starts flipping through it and he can't find what I'm talking about, or what I'm hinting at. And I start flipping through it and it takes me three times to flip through the magazine to find my own picture that I've blessed, sweat, and cried over a hundred times, and I never forget a picture. So I'm wondering what's up. Well, it turns out that what I just showed you was the international version of Newsweek. And what I'm about to show you is the domestic, what us North Americaners uh, get as our filtered news media. So uh, here's the article. It starts off. It ends. Notice it's separated by two full-page ads. Notice what they are. Uh, it's actually no longer its own article. It's in the upper left-hand corner. See, it says the global view of the global view of the cover story, which is your child's health and safety. I'll say for your kids really. <coughs> and um, let's take a look at these full-page ads. Well, let's take a look at what's missing first. Uh, that gets right where you can't even see the, the countries like Europe, Australia, Japan, Israel, the U.S., they don't have a mortality rate issue. So you think, since they don't have a problem, they don't know much about it, they might need the map to point out where the hell it is. Uh, no, we're not going to give them that. Um, and, you know, my name is the it's really small, so I just didn't really recognize it. And, uh, I'm an artist, and I have a fragile ego. <laughs> uh, 
But no, here, here's a, an article, uh, or a full page ad for um, plastics. A naked man being tackled by fully padded football players. Ouch! With, yeah, without plastics, you might as well be naked playing football. I have a problem with that on two counts. One, it's just not the right tone. It's not the right level of reverence that this critical social issue demands. It's also a trolling product, which is feeling many of the third world issues that um, you know that we that we've been talking about tonight. Finish it up with a string bikini model for Expedia.com, a uh, travel company paying a quarter of a million dollars to be to have their full page ad in major U.S. news weekly put in context with an article that paints a very war horny and sees through the picture of the world. And who the heck wants to travel into a world that you just get the hell out of them and said just don't go out of your house and I hurt you. Um, this is a waste of money for Expedia.com. It's an absolute waste of money. It's, this is this is what I'm doing is not commercially viable. So what I'm t what I'm telling you is media has created an environment um, in between kind of partnering with culture because it, it is for commercially viable. We all want to know what Britney Spears is up to and what Ryan Gosling is doing, right? Uh, and advertising, advertising, culture, and media together create an environment inhospitable to bringing you the world, to bring you your worldview. That's an awfully small envelope, and it's one that we ought to be expanding. 